Hi, and welcome to Crash Course Cryosphere. I'm Simon. I'm Tom. And Tom's going to be hogging the limelight this week and doing all the science. We've been looking at melt and transport. Whereas I am going to be doing a whole bunch of interviews with people here from the Scott Polar Research Institute, talking about what they do for a living. We have covered why water at the bed of the glacier is important, but how does it get there and how does that affect the energy budget that was discussed in previous episodes? Just to recap, the main source of energy is of course the sun, and we refer to the incoming and outgoing energy from the glacier surface as the net energy balance. This dynamic surface energy exchange means we tend to get a lot of phase states at the surface of the glacier, i.e. we get ice turning to water and water back to ice. However, if we move deeper into the glacier, about 10 to 15 metres down, then the temperature of the ice tends to remain effectively the same. This is actually quite a useful process, as it means that we can actually, when we use ice cores, calculate the mean annual air temperature for when ice was laid down below these 10 to 15 metre layer. The majority of water in a glacial system is actually delivered by surface melt and rain. This both delivers water and energy to the base of the glacier as the water freezes back on. Energy can also be absorbed at the base of the glacier via geothermal heating or frictional heating. In general, water flows following the gradient and hydraulic potential. In nature, this is always downhill. I mean, that's, everyone knows water flows downhill. However, in the glacier, this isn't necessarily the case. This is because the hydraulic potential is modified by the weight of the ice above. It's for this reason that under a glacier, water can actually flow uphill as it flows from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. To backtrack slightly, we still have water on the surface. So how does that move around? Well, there are three primary ways in which water is stored and moved on the surface of a glacier. The first of these is through fern. If you remember, fern is unconsolidated snow, which has moved from beyond one season to the next. Therefore, it's not fully glacier ice yet, but it's a bit more solid than the snow freshly fallen. Because of this, there's still lots of gaps, air passages and pores within it. Water finds it very easy to infiltrate this and tends to flow through that fern downhill, following the little channels that it can find. It's not channelized as such, but it is moving from pore to pore and flowing all the same. The second means by which water flows on the top of a glacier is via channels. These are very similar to the ones you perhaps see elsewhere in the natural world. But the interesting thing on a glacier is, is that because water can switch phase states so quickly, these channels and openings can appear and close very rapidly as well, on a scale of days, maybe even hours on a particularly active glacier surface. These channels tend to be proportional in size to the slope of which they're sitting. Thirdly, we have lakes, in which store water on the glacier surface. Lakes can appear very quickly on surfaces due to a high energy flux. For example, if it's just very, very sunny. This causes a lot of melt and water will rapidly accumulate in any depressions and grow from there. These lakes can then also drain incredibly quickly as fractures open up and channels become very rapidly formed. This means you can actually drain a huge lake, many Olympic pools in size, in a matter of hours. So what I'm going to try and demonstrate to you here is how different pore size spacing affects percolation. Now here we're using mixtures of sand, gravel and various other rocks, but the same applies to snow in terms of the pore sizes and the spaces between the ice crystals. On my right here, we have a mixture of sand and gravel. It's expected this would, in normal circumstances, drain fairly well, and you shouldn't have too much water sitting on the top after a while. On my left, I have a mixture of much larger clasts, and therefore you'd expect water to drain very much more quickly through this. However, this mixture also contains a certain amount of clay, particularly clay bound to the clasts because we've dried it out. But what the plan is, we're going to take each jug and pour about a litre of water in of each. And then hopefully the blue water will help you see the percolation happening as it moves through all the gaps in the material. And I suspect, place your bets, don't gamble now, on which one will finish first. So as we can see, the water on the left is ponding on the top. The air is escaping from underneath in this one. I think we may have completely saturated the sediment there. Yep, poured too much water in. <laughs> but hopefully you saw as it went through that it was ponding much quicker on the top of this one than on this one. So hopefully what you can see here, I'm trying to use a light to illuminate the side of it, is that in these larger clasts box, the water is very much all the way down to the bottom. If you're looking on the side of the box, the water's got all the way through because there's lots of gaps between. 
and you, like the rocks, uh, are, they're there, but they're completely surrounded by water. Whereas if we move to the other box, what we can see is because there's a lot of sand in the mixture, the sand is pushed down by the water and has filled up all the pore spaces below. If you tap the box, there's still a bit of water coming, a bit of air bubbles coming up, and those air bubbles are trapped, trapped below sand layers, which are then disturbed when we move it. So there you have the impact of sand on the different porosity. The sand is filling in the gaps between the gravel, whereas in this larger one, there's no sand or not enough clay to fill the gaps between the large clasts, and therefore the water just drops straight through. A lot of the phenomena we've been looking at in this episode require very precise measurements, and we have a method of getting precise measurements here. It's Charlotte with a stick. It is, indeed. Uh, so what we've got then is a GPS unit that's got a little screen so you can read off some numbers, and a stick with an antenna on the top, or more precisely, it's a receiver. So what happens is you've got your GPS satellites and they're in orbit, and they are transmitting all the time uh, a few bits of data. So there's a time, so that you know how long your signal has taken to travel, and where it sits in relation to a few other things. So this is receiving all of that information from multiple satellites and using that to work out its location. So you find out the location of this, and then on the stick we've got measurements. Mm -hmm. And so what you're doing is you're measuring how far away the ground is from your receiver so that you can then take that off your final measurement when you're noting down your results. And this is a relatively modern development. GPS has only been around for the past couple of decades. Yeah, exactly. Um, so before that, you had to be really good at your cartography and your map making and all those other more traditional forms of navigation to tell where you were. But yeah, it made it a lot more simple being able so to So yeah, this, is, this was like a quantum leap, I suppose, in the, mm. the precision that was possible. Yeah, and it's really important because a lot of the polar regions don't have huge numbers of kind of features that you can relate to. So uh, particularly the Antarctic is a desert, so mm. it's flat up on the plateau. There aren't necessarily mountain ranges that you can easily pinpoint and make sure that you've got your location particularly precise for. So I was chatting to someone the other day who was going back and doing measurements in the same places as they were taken during the International Geophysical Year in the late 1950s. And she said the main problem with it was actually finding out where they had taken their measurements because they didn't have a means of doing really precision uh, locations. So yeah, it was a bit of hoping they'd got things in the right place so they could do that comparison work. And also making life a lot safer because if you know where you are, people know where you are. Yeah, absolutely. Though, of course, communication is yet another challenge because uh, communication satellites are different to the GPS satellites. There's quite a good constellation of GPS satellites around, but the comm satellites aren't so good at covering the polar regions. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you need to make sure that someone knows where you are and that you can tell them where you are yeah. if you get in trouble. <laughs> yeah. So that is how the water is moving across the surface of the glacier. We'll discuss subglacial movement in much more detail, but we're missing what's in between. How does water move n-glacially? N-glacial just means inside the glacier. N-glacial passages can form in three main ways. The first of these is when a surface channel becomes n-glacial. This can happen when the surface ablation is not greater than the creep. Therefore, as the channel lowers into the ice, the surface gets higher and higher up, and the creep slowly closes the top. All of a sudden, your surface channel has become an n-glacial channel. The second mechanism is by hydraulic exploitation of pre-existing crevasses. This is where the pressure and flow of the water in a crevasse causes it to open up and become more of a channel. This can also lead to the crevasses being linked up by flowing water. And finally, you have the exploitation of permeable structures by the water. So now we've formed our n-glacial channels, but of course, having formed them, we can also close them. And this can happen pretty rapidly. There are three main ways in which these n-glacial channels can disappear. Firstly, you get an increase in the ice overburden pressure that exceeds the ability of the water to keep the channel open. This means that again, ice creep takes over and the channel slowly closes, even if there's water flowing in it. The second means by which a channel closes is if the water ceases to flow. At this point, you no longer have water keeping the channel open through frictional drag or pressure, and therefore the channel starts to close through creep naturally. And finally, particularly in no marginal areas, you can have sediment backfilling the channel. This happens particularly when you have a drop in energy as the water leaves the glacier and therefore sediment becomes deposited. This sediment can slowly backfill, eventually closing the channel if the water pressure isn't high enough to keep moving material away from the entrance to the conduit. All the connection and storage mechanisms that we've just seen can open and close very rapidly. In many ways, it's this rapid connection which is one of the key factors of why the cryosphere responds so quickly to climate change and changes in their local environment. These channels can open and close and deliver water to the bed very quickly. The delivery of this water to the bed is a key component in glacier flow, as we'll see in the next episode. 
Now we have the next of our interviews with cryospheric scientists. And this week we're talking to, well, I'll, I'll let him introduce himself. I'm Gareth Rees, Dr Gareth Rees. I'm a senior lecturer at Scott Polar Research Institute and I'm fundamentally a specialist in remote sensing. Well, I will try to define remote sensing. It's, it's actually quite a tricky thing to do, but it's, I mean, in principle, it's just looking at something without, uh, or obtaining information from something without coming into contact with it. But uh, for our purposes, and it's often called Earth observation, uh, when it's this kind of remote sensing we're talking about, it's using images from satellites or aircraft or drones or something airborne or spaceborne to collect collect data from the Earth's surface. You can collect data from the atmosphere as well, and colleagues do that, but that's not really my thing. So looking at the Earth's surface from things like satellite images. So every time you, you, know, you look at Google Earth, you're actually doing some remote sensing. About 10, 15 years ago, I, I didn't switch exactly from uh, looking at the cryosphere to looking at the um, vegetated environment, high latitude vegetation, but I, I kind of added that as a, um, as a major research interest. And um, what initially got us um, interested in that was the possibility of uh, monitoring the impact of um, atmospheric pollution on high latitude vegetation. When I came to it in the first place, I thought, well, there isn't any, you know, it's a nice clean place. Um, but if you work in Russia, actually, there's tons of it. So we, we cut our teeth looking at the impact of um, uh, industrial pollution from things like nickel smelting on tundra vegetation. And it's mind-boggling in its extent and its ferocity in some places. So that was quite exciting in a negative sort of way. Uh, I guess the other thing that's really given me one of those, wow, look at what you can do moments, is, has been um, LIDAR. And that was a properly cryospheric application. Um, what happened about, again, about 10 years ago, I would say, this wasn't a new technology. It wasn't as if somebody suddenly invented LIDAR. This is um, using laser pulses to uh, measure the geometry of something, you know, like bats do with their sonar. Um, but the technology just took a step forward and it suddenly became much, much better. And we had an opportunity uh, to collect some data um, through NERC. Um, yeah, NERC had an announcement of opportunity from Svalbard. So we went to our pet glacier, which is Midra Lovenbrain, Svalbard. And I guess the NERC plane flew over the glacier for 50 minutes or something like that, and it collected a data set, which, once we got it back to Cambridge and processed it, just made us say, wow, look what you can do. Nobody knew you could do that before. And, you know, we're all doing it now. But at the time, that was very exciting. The acquisition that NERC gave us, so, the, so they, they, they had this mission to Svalbard and they um, collected some data and they weren't completely happy with the data collection. So they said they were going to run it again in two years' time. And because they'd missed some, to us, unimportant bits off the upper part of the glacier. They said, we'll do your glacier again for nothing. So we said, yeah, we're up for that. And um, so we got two acquisitions two years apart. And again, that was at the time that was unprecedented to have that level of spatial and temporal resolution of change on the glacier. And yeah, it had done lots. Um, it had shrunk. Um, the um, terminus had shrunk back by, I think, 13 metres in those um, two years. And the um, mean thickness had decreased by 0.65 of a meter or something like that. So um, whether that's completely attributable to climate change or whether this is a little bounce back from the little ice age uh, is probably still a bit open actually but yes in the sense that something changed about the climate and the glacier respond to it, responded to it, yes we saw that extremely clearly. This episode we covered that most water in the glacial system comes from surface melt and rainfall onto the glacier surface, that lakes can form and disappear on the surface of a glacier very quickly, and that water enters a glacier through holes in its surface and moves through a glacier via in glacial channels. All this means that water can travel very quickly through a glacial system, providing rapid feedback between changes in climate and precipitation patterns and the glacier's behaviour. 
Thank you for watching Crash Course Cryosphere. If you'd like to take your understanding of the subjects covered in this episode further, there are links down there in the description. And if you have questions about the material covered, then Tom and I will be in the comments for the next two hours after this is uploaded. We'd like to thank all of these lovely people up here who helped make this series possible, and in particular, the Recover Project at Exeter University for helping fund this, and the Scott Polar Research Institute for housing us and being so accommodating. We'll see you next week for more IC action.